very sad. Um, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. And so that's uh, what I really wanted you to hear. I still don't know what I'm doing here. But let's just go blow this up. Oh. And close this. Okay, um, there's still a million things we could do in chapter one. You okay if it's but we got to small move. up there, or would you rather to make it through the letter? But also, just it's it. good to keep a pace and to let things develop. We don't have to solve it all right now. Uh, we do have five more chapters uh, where we can keep uh, uh, developing ideas. So let's turn our attention to chapter two, um, which as a whole movement, 22 verses, um, Paul has uh, given us two passes through the same story from different angles. Uh, he's clearly um, designed this as two paragraphs. Verses 1 through 10 of chapter 2 begins with uh, zombies, the living dead. Um, Y'all were the living dead. Verses 11 through 22 begin with language of uh, foreigners and exiles and strangers. So in verses 1 through 10, you go from zombies to new humans. In verses 11 through 22, you go to outsiders to the covenant, to fellow family members in God's covenant family. Um, the chart here is just a way to show that he's actually designed both of these paragraphs in parallel with each other. They both begin with Paul saying, hey, remember what you used to be at that time. So you were dead in transgressions and sins, in which at that time you walked doing the desires of the flesh. At the beginning of the second paragraph, remember at that time, you nations or Gentiles in the flesh were estranged from citizenship in Israel. In both cases, he's gonna identify the thing that prevented them from entering into the new creation. Think back to our drawing here. There was some kind of power, something, to which they were enslaved or captive. Um, in verses one through 10, he calls this captor the ruler of the authority of the air. Okay, <laughs> we'll talk about that. The 
thing preventing them from entering into the new covenant family is identified so as something video is that is, was really difficult for the first generations of the Jesus movement, so the process. That the Torah, which was one of God's beautiful gifts to Israel, simultaneously was God's goodwill, but that brought death and curse because of Israel's inability to fulfill its role as the covenant. And it also generated hostility between Israel and the outsiders. And this is the challenging issue of Paul's view of the law or the Torah. And so we'll have to at least find a way to frame that up. In both cases, God intervened. In the first paragraph, he's rich in mercy. We were dead, but he made us alive together with the Messiah. In the second paragraph, but now in Messiah Jesus, you who were far have been brought near. And in both cases, um, the result of the now and not yet is used in creation language. In the first paragraph, he made you alive together, raised you up together. You've been created in Messiah Jesus, it's new creation language here. In the second paragraph, he made both groups into one to create the two into one new humanity. I use the phrase new humanity a lot. Um, that's because it's Paul's phrase, <laughs> the new humanity. Paul's view of salvation is the creation of a new humanity in the Messiah. So that's just, it's kind of a macro view, but do you see each of these paragraphs, he's really carefully designed them to walk, um, walk through the same storyline from two, from two perspectives. So should we just take them one at a time? Look at some uh, interesting things. First, let's just read them. So two, one through 10, I'm looking at the logical outline translation. <clears throat> and y'all being dead in y'all's transgressions and sins in which at one time y'all walked according to the age of this world, according to the ruler of the authority of the air, the spirit who is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among the sons of disobedience, we also used to live. Ah, do you see the you and the we? Who's the you? Remember this, Gentiles, who's the we? Israel. Do you see what he's saying right here? You Gentiles were lost, dead in transgressions and sins, and guess what? So were we. Even the covenant people were lost in our transgressions and sin. Read Joshua through Kings in the Old Testament, and uh, it's, very, it's very clear that they didn't have their act together either. So, among whom we also used to live by the passions of our flesh, doing the will of the flesh and of the mindsets. He uses a plural noun here. Many mindsets uh, that you can choose in our world, and all of them, according to Paul, lead toward death, except the apocalyptic mindset. So we also all used to live by the passions and doing the will of the flesh. And we were by nature children of wrath, as were also the rest. Well, that was the state of y'all and us. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, break off that sentence. Your grammar teacher would be really annoyed right now. Breaks mid-sentence. And we, being dead in our transgressions, he, that is God, made us alive together with the Messiah. By grace, y'all have been saved. And he raised us up together, and he sat us together in the heavenlies with Messiah Jesus. Why did he do that? Why did he make us alive and raise us and seat us together? In order that he might demonstrate in the ages that are coming the surpassing richness of his grace by kindness to us in Messiah Jesus. For it is by grace that y'all have been saved through trust. And this package deal is not from y'all selves. It's the gift of God. It's not something you worked for in order that no one can boast. For we, that is the new humanity, are his handiwork. 
having been created in Messiah Jesus. And though it isn't from your works, it is for works, isn't it? Created for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Oh, what a paragraph. This is exquisite in every way. So beautiful, man. This is worth many cups of tea and long walks. And uh, <clears throat> in the note, so I just indicated uh, something in color that I found helpful. He's got two focus points in this paragraph. The state of we and y'all and the contrasting portrait of God in response to the we. So notice uh, here in, in gray, at least on the handout, in one color, what's the state of y'all? Dead, captive to flesh, captive to mindsets under slavery, under the authority of the, a ruler. In contrast to that, we have God who's, what, what is God's response to dead, rebellious, self-destructing humans? Mercy. Mercy expressed with what? And notice how he introduces the mercy, breaks a sentence, reminds us of the human condition. Do you see how it's balanced? like this. It's just so cool how he did that. It's as if he gives you a little taste of mercy, reminds you of the last, like the death knell of death itself, and then on into new creation. And then once he talks about God's activity, it's just all this resurrection language and enthronement language. Oh, who has all, who has been raised up and is ruling heaven and earth in chapter one? It's the exalted Messiah. And now he fills out um, the portrait, doesn't he? Let's go back to our drawing. <clears throat> if we have uh, Jesus exalted uh, here, now he wants uh, to fill out the picture. To find yourself. <clears throat> and it's all in him. In him, we are already currently reigning together. And then he, uh, he qualifies two things here. We're gonna uh, zoom in on this ruler, the ruler of the air, uh, but just because this is one of the most classic statements of Paul's theology of grace. Um, when Paul says that it's by grace, it's a, he has a couple angles, a few ways that that sword cuts. First of all, it means it's not something that's generated by our own effort. Um, I, I'm a, a mortal human. I'm going to die unless somebody who has power over death can help me with that. <laughs> I mean, this is very clear, right? It's very intuitive. Um, that's not something I can generate for myself. That's something that must be received as a gift. Um, this Paul's famous, he's well known for this phrase, it's not from works. This is going to become really focused and applied in his letter to the Galatians and in the Romans about works of the Torah, observances of the Torah, which he believes are good, but that are good for some things and not for other things, namely earning God's mercy. And so notice what the grace gift of a new creation creates in terms of its social implications, this boasting here. I don't know, boast isn't, do you guys use that word, boast? <laughs> Brag? Uh, yeah, Brag doesn't get us there. Typically, uh, we tend to read this in an individualist fashion. Namely, um, I am trying to earn my own standing before God. Um, and I cannot boast. Where Paul is going to be passionate to apply this is how this affects social relationships within a church community. Uh, he's going to apply nobody being able to boast in terms of men and male and female and slave and free and barbarian or Scythian or Greek or Jew. It's a social concept for Paul. Um, it's very, it's the same thing undergirding when in Galatians. It's a different context, different debate, same theology coming out. Y'all are sons of God 
through faith in Messiah Jesus, y'all. All of you who are baptized into Messiah have closed yourself with Messiah. So if y'all are in him, there is no Jew or Greek. Really? Because <laughs> I go to my house church in Ephesus, and there's like, there's three Jewish people. There's a Macedonian. There's this, we don't know where that guy's from. <laughs> right? uh, there's like a master who comes with his slave. Right, right? just name, name the room. And he's naming the people who attend this house church community. And what he's saying is those things um, that define your identities outside of the gathering um, are irrelevant in the new creation. They're irrelevant to your status, to your worth before God and therefore before each other. I mean, dude, this is a manifesto for a new creation right here. So I, I, the reason I'm bringing this up is in, at least in the history of many Protestant traditions, um, this works and grace and gift and not boasting is only ever applied on the individual level of me trying to merit God's favor. I can't merit God's favor. And that's true. Um, but when Paul wants to cash this out in terms of practice, he moves into what we call social issues <laughs> or economic issues. And because for him, it's about the birth of a new creation and the whole, a whole birth of a new, a new way of human beings relating to each other, where the things that define people and divide them and assign them different levels of status, are they're irrelevant. And they're irrelevant because did Jesus die only for the wealthy? Did Jesus die only for one gender? Did Jesus die? Of course not. Um, it's hugely significant to this paragraph here. Um, and he's going to actually cash it out within, within the letter itself in very social terms. All right, so um, before we go on to the grace video, which is the meat of today, but I, I, it felt important to kind of watch this video because he sets it all up. But one of the questions, and I hope all of you who are watching online can hear this, because um, there are actually five people watching with us. Um, yay, we've doubled. Um, so the question that comes with this study, which I thought was a good question, often understood, Ephesians 2.8, if you've got your Bible, it says, uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. It's a huge, famous verse, maybe one of the most quoted of all of Paul's writings, and um, often that is understood as individ individualistic, as he said. Um, but as you've seen him say, you all, y'all, y'all, um, it's not. It's not what Paul was saying. It, in, so the question then becomes, in what ways has seeing this verse applied to the social relationships within a church community changed your understanding? Because if you think about that verse, it's often for, it's so easy to read that for by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. It's so easy to read that as me and Jesus. What does it mean to know Paul was writing that to a community, not just to a person? So I'll start. <laughs> Yesterday, if you were in the early service, we baptized an almost 16-year-old named Lenny. And Lenny, um, for one reason or another, has decided that faith is an important thing for her. She's been needed. She never had confirmation, never had any education on baptism, any of that. But she's been meeting, and I love this about Amelia. Amelia's willing to take an hour before Bible study every week with the youth group and meet with her and, and even her parents on occasion and discuss 
They've had many meetings where she's basically put her through confirmation on her own. And so baptizing her yesterday was a beautiful thing for me and I think for Amelia and for Tony because she has this understanding that she is being baptized into this community and somehow in it this gift of grace is coming to her and it, it isn't just her and Jesus it's her loving being a part of this place and this community and so that's an easy way for me to kind of see a little bit of what Paul's talking about here does that make sense Example, I'm just not coming up with. Yeah. I mean, I never thought it was individual. You never I saw it that way. No. I didn't. Okay. I thought it was y'all. Yeah. So you've always heard it that way. Well, uh, that's what I always thought it meant. Yeah. You know, I suppose I could have taken it the other way, but I didn't. Well, it is for everybody, and for me individually. It's both. Yeah. I mean, because that's my, that's uh, what my relationship with God is, is through grace. But it's for the community, you know. Yeah. Everyone. Y'all. Okay. So you've kind of always heard it that way as well. I never really thought about it, but okay. um, I referenced my confirmation background and Grace was if you don't bring nothing else, you're gonna learn about grace. Yeah. So I mean it's always been foremost. Okay. Cool. Other thoughts? I agree with I never thought I was an individual. I always thought it was a community. Okay. Grace is given to everyone. And when it says you, it's it's everybody. Uh, that's how my my interpretation of it works. I look at me as being a part of you. Yeah. Yeah. I've never thought of it individually. Okay. And, and this letter wasn't just to one person. It was to just two of you. Teachers. So look at you being the all of you being the teachers. That's good because um, I think and and probably what I'm guessing is most of uh, of you who said this have always been a part of the community, right? Where, and let's face it, most of us here, myself included, older, and uh, the younger generation now are like, why? What do I need to be a part of that for? And so, this message, I think, is one that maybe the church could be better about saying it's not just about you and Jesus. And I'm not saying that in terms of God to be a part of the church, but but what if you wanted to be? Because I mean, I, I think in the church we've always kind of tried to just get people to come on, come on back. Um, but somehow we're missing the reason. <laughs> and, and the one thing to me that the church is kind of missing out on our are, I don't know if the church can do it, but I should just be doing a better job of people are so lonely now. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially, you know, I mean, everybody's on their cell phone. You know, you don't see the kids talking to each other at the bus stop. They're all like this. Yeah. And so you don't have the, the community of the church. And I think that's one of the reasons, you know, this does a really good job with the young kids, but then you got to hang on to them. And also get in the young adults. Yeah. That, that, uh, I'm looking at my phone right now as you say that because people are the seven people that are watching. Marcia says, always thought the verse was individualistic, never thought of it as community, uh, but the community of the church, but the community of the church supports. Uh, and she's asking, can you still have a personal relationship with God? Um, I think we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, Marcia. And, and um, yes, of course you can have a personal relationship with God, but that is never really talked about 
in Paul's writings. I think we talked about that a few weeks ago. Like, um, it's always community based, it's never been you and Jesus, although that is important to be sure. Um, and I think actually, as we go into the next video of the day, make sure we uh, have time to do that. It's about 14 minutes, I think. And he's going to get into grace. Um, Janet is saying, while I knew that Paul was speaking to everyone, I now hear you all when I read this. Uh, even though it sounds like horrible English, it, it does make a good point. What do you think? So? Other thoughts before I go on to the next? I have a question. Very early in the uh, presentation, he made a distinction between you and we. Yeah. You being Gentiles and we being Israel. Right. And yet throughout that distinction disappeared. Because then it was always we, 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 which means that every time throughout, we as Israel, and he's leaving out you. Mm. So I don't know why. I don't know if that distinction was important, but he said it. Yeah. Yeah, I know when he, what, whatever verse that was that he was talking about that, it was basically to say we've all fallen short. Yeah. But yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer. But he made the distinction between you, the Gentiles. Yeah. We. Yeah. Um, yeah, good question. Any thoughts on that? I'm just thinking of the creed where we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, and communion of saints. That's what that's what it is. It's a communion of saints. It's mm -hmm. not, not an individual belief, or it's, it's not a belief in an individual. Yeah. You, you, I mean, when you're saying the creed, you're saying it as the communion of saints. Yeah. The Catholic Church. Small C, not large C. Universal. Yeah. It's just the number one question we get asked about the creed. Why do we say that? All right, let me uh, push this on to Grace here. Um, some other questions are continuing to come in, which I like. All right. This one I found fascinating, and I'll be honest, it challenged me a little. So we'll see what it does for you. Come on. We lose our Wi Fi. Hang in there, everyone. You don't want to come up.
Come on. All right, let's try again. Watch again. Make me try to remember what he said. It's huh? There's nothing working. It just says setting up. Sorry, there was a problem. Would you like to read? Yes. Okay, you can see up here if I got. There we go. Yay. So yeah, let's talk about um, Paul's concept of grace. Our English word grace <clears throat> renders uh, his Greek word charis. Anybody know a Karis? Anybody named Karis? Karis? Here's what's fascinating is uh, it's Greek, foremost, it's the Greek word for gift, like a physical gift. Literally, it refers to a gift. And then metaphorically, it can refer to the attitude or attribute of the one giving the gift. So a concrete gift is a grace, but we often use the word grace to describe how God feels or how, how you describe his nature as he gives the gift. And it's the, same, it's the same thing. What constitutes a gift and what the meaning of a gift is, is totally determined by where and when you grow up. In uh, Western, especially late capitalist societies, the most virtuous gift is a gift that's given for no reason. <clears throat> like the most perfect gift, you know, in, in at least in the culture I grew up in, is a gift that's given spontaneously and with no strings attached. Um, that is a, a late Western concept of a gift. Um, you travel to most any traditional culture on the planet, you give a gift because you want to establish a relationship of reciprocity and you give it and that doesn't diminish its giftness that defines the giftness is i want to connect with you i want to be bonded with you and you can be bonded in ways that are unhealthy i want to put you in my debt and so i give you i remember the first time i got on an airplane it was to go spend the summer in papua new guinea i was 20 and uh it was to go like live and be exposed to like front edge tribal missionaries who are translating into um, written languages and this kind of thing. It was amazing. And I remember uh, we got this, one of the little like culture talks they gave us is, hey, like people are gonna be excited that you're here and um, don't accept any gifts. And, and we're like, wait, why? Well, they're like, well, if you want um, to be indebted to somebody, then take the gift. Um, but just know that they'll be at your doorstep the next day, waiting for you to pull something out of your suitcase for them. In other words, gifts were a way to create uh, uh, obligations <laughs> to people. So that, that can be say it, it is a way a, a gift can go wrong. In other words, the motive for the gift is simply to put you in my debt. The gifts are complicated in many cultures. And so different cultures have different ways of conceiving of the gift. What, what seems to be Paul's main focus, um, the thing that he harps on, and we saw it right here, it's the mismatch between someone's worthiness and the abundance of the, and the, and the lavishness of the gift. Um, so scholars call this the incongruity of the gift. So what, what fascinates Paul is humanity's destroying itself and God's gift is of a new humanity. And for him, that's such a mismatch in terms of worth 
that that's the element of the giftedness that he highlights. However, this is interesting. Even though he uses the word grace, does Paul think that we are obligated to respond after having received the gift? Are there strings attached? Are there strings attached? <laughs> he very much assumes that this gift comes with an obligation to respond in trust. What is trust? It's, it's offering your loyalty to the one who offered you the gift. Totally, totally. And again, if, that, if you've ever been reading Paul and, and you think like, oh yeah, grace, he's the apostle of grace. But then he really will lean in hard in these moral challenges and talk about how we will be held accountable for our works before the judgment seat of Christ. And for many people, that's a contradiction because, well, I thought this was all a gift. What do you mean you're going to hold me accountable for my response if it was a gift? It's not a contradiction in Paul's mind. Um, in Paul's mind, grace is, per is perfect in that it's given to somebody who's not worthy, um, but that he does expect reciprocity. It's a gift given with the expectation of reciprocity. And that doesn't mean it's not grace. It just means it's not grace according to my modern Western definition. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, what, what, I'm, what I'm summarizing here, just to, because this is really helpful, um, is the work of a New Testament scholar uh, named John Barclay. Uh, and, and it's written just a couple years ago. Um, but it's, it's, it's a game, it's a game changing book. He's done, do. Uh, he's done a history of how all of the most important fathers and scholars uh, of the church have understood the meaning of grace throughout church history. And then the rest of the book is saying, well, they kind of get it. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, um, the church has had a hard time grappling with what Paul actually meant by that word. And all these debates about lordship and salvation, can you be saved but not have Jesus as your Lord? And if salvation is by grace, how can there be judgment by works? And these are our problems. Once again, these are our problems, not listening to Paul in his own terms. It's a fat book, but YouTube the guy, and he summarized the book in many like little 45 minute lectures that are all free online and so on. But, uh, I, you know, if you're ever going to, be talking to other people about grace and reading Paul's letters. Um, you owe it to yourself and those who listen to you to at least listen to one of his lectures online. It's so illuminating. And just, it, it's a, once again, it's a cross-cultural factor that we have a different concept of what grace is than, than what Paul did. And in Paul's mind, you can call it grace and have it still be something that um, obligates me to respond. And it seems, my last thing, and then I'll hear what you guys are thinking, it seems like this is what Paul is getting at when he uses the word grace in a way that is surprising to us. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 15, he'll uh, say, listen, um, I'm the least of the apostles. I was the last one. <laughs> uh, I used to help like, arranged the assassination of Christians. Uh, he, he carries that his whole life. The least of the apostles. I shouldn't even be one because I persecuted the church of God. It's only by God's grace. And that makes sense. Incongruous. I don't deserve it, but he gave me the gift anyway. And then we'll look what he says here. His grace to me did not prove in vain. He gave me the gift and I have been reciprocating. Are you with me? I'm, I'm, earn, I'm, he's not earning the gift, but he is giving his obligated loyalty in light of being given the gift. And then look at what he says. Some people get nervous here. In fact, you want to know what? I've worked harder than all the other apostles. Excuse me. Not me, but the grace of God with me. So what does grace mean right there? It's fascinating. Grace is like a power. It's a power. The, so the, with, this gift isn't a gift that just is a transaction. 
It's like an ongoing source of energy and inspiration and personal love and presence to him. So he, it, there's a number of times he uses the word grace where you could put in the word Holy Spirit and you, would, you, all, you wouldn't miss a beat. It's as if um, the sheer abundance and mismatch of his worth and God's generosity becomes a vi vital power in his life. Isn't this interesting? So yeah, when Paul says grace, he's got a fully worked out thing in his head that isn't just theology, it's his life experience. So I didn't see this until just now. So I kind of just want to walk this through. This is that I'm getting this. I've always kind of just jumped over verse 10, like real quick. But it looks like what he's saying there is that because of, you know, because we're his handiwork and we're in the Messiah, right? We're created in him that it's the good works he's expecting. Yeah. As the. That's right. I got that, right? Yeah, that's right. In other words, uh, he repeats the word. It's not from works. It, um, hmm. Maybe here's the way to put this. This is the way Barclay puts it. That was helpful for me. He says, uh, he thinks Protestants are way too blurry and loosey-goosey with our language about grace. Um, he thinks what Paul believes is that grace is unconditioned. Unconditioned. It isn't given on the basis of worth. Um, but that is very different than saying grace is unconditional, no expectation of return. Now, the return that you give will always pale in comparison to the abundance. What can I give? Really, what can I give? My, my life? Um, yes. Yes, my life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is the worth of my life in relationship to the value of the universe? Yeah, not a lot, but it's what I have, and that is what's expected. That's the, the reciprocity. That's right. So to me, that was very helpful. So all of a sudden, Paul um, saying, you're not saved by works, but you sure are saved for works. It's not a contradiction in his mind. It, 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 that's the nature of grace, is to establish, and, and by the way, as you're going to discover, Paul thinks that even our motivation and power and energy for good works is itself an act of grace. Um, or as he'll say, and this is one of my favorite, in Philippians, I am confident in Philippians chapter one, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it. He will perfect it. So there's all divine initiative. God begins it, God completes it. One of the opening lines of the letter. Look at what um, he goes on to say in 2.12. Yes, all right. So then, just as, you, as you've always obeyed, not just when I'm around, but even much more when I'm, when I'm gone, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So work, not work at, <laughs> work out. So salvation is something I'm given, but then it's something that creates an obligation to me to like respond. And, but then look at what he says, lest you think that this is all about you. Listen, when you are working, it's God who's working in you, both your willing and desire to work it out and in your actual working it out. This is exactly what I said in Corinthians. I worked harder than all of them. Excuse me. <laughs> it was me doing it, but it was, yeah, it's as Paul saying me, but not me. Do it, but not you. You, but not you. And in Paul's mind, this isn't a contradiction. This is like what it means to be a new human, is that my will is so merged with God's will that it's me and God, not to the exclusion of each other, but to the full union of each other. Uh, mysteries in Paul's mind, but I <laughs> he's got some category for thinking about me and God becoming one in Christ so that it's me and not me at the same time. Um, 
I don't know, that's many cups of tea and long walks, but and it it's all connected to grace. That's why we're talking about this. Grace is a power. Okay. To me, this relates back to um, John 15, where Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. Yeah. That's, that's the works that he has for us. Yeah, good. It, it all kind of ties together to me. That's right. Good. That's a good, um, what you can say is Paul and John are expressing, excuse me, John, Jesus in John's gospel is expressing same theological idea, but with different language and imagery. And the moment you see different apostles articulating the same ideas, but with different language, you know you're, okay, this is clearly something important in the New Testament, because they're all saying it, they just have their different ways of saying it. That's exactly right. And so is it, like Jesus says, um, you're the one who needs to produce the fruit, but of course it's not your fruit, because you're ab abiding in the vine, is the metaphor he uses. Yeah. Yes, let's pause. This is so, this is one of my favorite themes of Paul's writings, if you can tell. We see our free will. When we talk about our will and agency, we talk about it in mutually exclusive terms. If I do it, it's not you doing it. And that, that's very intuitive. If I like mow my lawn, you didn't mow my lawn, I mowed my lawn. But when Paul starts talking about the new humanity, that is, is just as Jesus is one with the Father, so we are brought into the divine life. When he talks about our will in relation to God's will, he starts using what seems contradictory language to us. It's not me, it's God and me. <laughs> so get up out of your chair and work out your salvation with fear and trembling, remembering that it's not you, but it is you. And so he's got some way of viewing his connection to Jesus that breaks my brain. But I find the longer I sit with it, the more I experience it in some moments <laughs> when I'm loving my neighbor as myself, I, you know, uh, it's less often than I'd like. But when I am in those moments, I have to do it a lot with my kids. And I'll look back and I'll be like, oh, man. I, I don't know how I was able to be patient with my five-year-old that day. That was me and it was not me. I was just wondering in the last part of verse 10, when Paul is talking about the good works that were prepared beforehand, if we are still talking about predestination, that framework where he's having Israel as the backdrop of the predestination, you know, if, if we're still on that mindset or he's defining and getting more specific, God has for you a less specific individualistic plan that you have to tap into it. Yeah. Um, uh, Paul developed his theology both from reading the scriptures and from his lived experience um, in the mission to the Gentiles. And for sure, what he personally experienced was the mission to the Gentiles was something he was called to do, but also found was happening before his eyes. And he was just the one, he happened to be the person on the scene in many of these situations. He goes to Philippi and there's Lydia and she's ready, dude. Like she's ready. He didn't do that. He just, I'm gonna go ahead and yeah, stop his image in first Corinthians of, Kind of goes on um, with more of the listen, same. One is the sower. Um, one's the it's got about five minutes left, but I really wanted to hear your thoughts on that concept of grace. Um, so the question that came with the chapter or this uh, session was: For Paul, grace is a gift given to someone who is not worthy, but it is also given with the expectation of reciprocity or response. How does this transform your understanding of grace? Because I know for me, you'll see a Lutheran pastor, reciprocity isn't something we've always spent much time on. Honestly. Anytime. Huh? Anytime. It's well, we talk a lot about response. Yes. But it's your not so much reciprocity. That's a different your response and living out your faith 
Yes. As a as a response to grace, I what I don't. That's something totally out of field. Oh, sorry, I cut you off. No, you're still. Sorry. Go ahead. I mean, I mean, if it feels like it's coming out of left field, it's something I'm going to have to adjust to because I've never thought of it that way. Yeah. We've always, even though it's said in a group format, you know, in community, when you take it personally, it has never been assumed that there was a reciprocity, you know, that there was something it had always been felt that grace was freely given. There's nothing you can do to earn it. And if you wanted to be a little bit of a pain in the tush about it, why bother? Yeah. And what this is doing is this is this is putting that to the side and saying, no, wait a minute. There's, there's something that we that he's expecting of us, even though you've always been told that grace was freely given and didn't cost you a thing. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Hmm. Now, I don't say that I disagree with it because you know the way I've grown up in the church, you always worked to, you know. You work for the community, you work for whatever, you know, you, you tried to live out your faith as best you could, and that meant doing for yeah. others. All I have to do now is put that living out piece together with the piece that says grace was freely given, and you're living in community as the reciprocity. Unless I'm misunderstanding something. So good works are a response to grace. That's the yeah. Mm -hmm. Although Janet and Joe are Janet, on. Yes. Janet and Joe are on, who have been a part of this class. And uh, Janet's out in the desert, and Joe's in Tascala. They both say hi from different places. But Joe says if you really accept his gift in your life, you have no choice but to respond through him. Joe says, Janet says, I mostly agree, but it becomes a problem if we start deciding whose works are worthy or not good enough. Uh, the definition of works is very broad. Uh, works to me are a response. Which that's kind of the, um, and then Joe says, we always fall short. Um, I guess I've always seen works also, as Janet said, as response and not something for us to judge or try to measure. This is what I was going to understand uh, from the perspective of someone that has been raised in a traditional. Uh, traditional families, not structure, construction. Um, so think of parent and child, parents and child, family, traditional. Um, parents give their child identity. They name them. They spend a lot of time thinking about what the right name would be. They instill in them family values, so it's an identity that comes down from the parents. Thinking family, parent, child, God, community. Um, traditionally, the response by the child is loyalty. Identity comes down to you. Loyalty goes from the child back to the parent. The parent then responds to loyalty with trust, which is, Tim has that going the opposite direction. I can use it. The, so the parent entrusts the child with responsibility, with duties, with expectations. The child responds with obedience. 
And so in, in that structure, there is, it's like, well, works doesn't, the parent doesn't give the child identity and trust because the child deserves it, has earned it. The child gives loyalty back. Trust is something that comes down, and trusting is something that comes down from the parent because that's what you do with your children. You can trust them with responsibilities that cause them to grow and become more like what the family is. They engage more in the family. And the child responds to that through expectations with those responsibilities is that they're going to respond with obedience. They're going to do the responsibilities, you're going to engage in the duties um, with the understanding of the way the parent is expecting you to engage in those responsibilities. You're gonna mow the lawn in the way the parent would expect you to mow the lawn because that's what your response to the trust of that is, is obedience. The family as a whole gets the lawn mowed. So did you mow the lawn? Well, yes, you personally mowed the lawn, but you did it in the way that the family expected you to do as your contribution to the family. So what if you don't? Are you out of the family? Well, that is a question. And in a traditional family, if you reject the identity that the parent is giving you, if you reject the responsibilities and the duties that have been entrusted, you get to the point where you have rejected the family itself. And yeah, in a traditional family, in a Middle East family, right? traditional family structure, that can get violent because you're basically doing the prodigal son, right? You're telling the, the family, up yours. I'm me, I'm going to do what I want in the way I want. Yeah. Kind of sounds like, you know, Garden of Eden, right? Mm -hmm. I think uh, I have heard this before that, you know, we don't get anything by works. But it follows naturally that we we want to when we experience the love of God. Yeah. When the blessings come in and we realize that's where it's coming from, we're going to want to do those things. Um, we're not perfect from the minute we get, you know, believe, and that's where the author and perfecter of our faith yeah. kind of cleans all that out eventually. Or selfishness could rise up, and we'd say no. I don't want to do that. I'll take your gifts, but I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. But that's kind of how I look at it because we feel identified with the love of God that we can't help ourselves but want to do something. One of my favorite quotes I've shared many times is uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and uh, do what you want. And people always hear that and say, if I love the Lord, why would I? How could I do what I want? But if you think about the first part of that, love the Lord your God with all your heart, then what your what God's heart is is what your heart hopefully is. And but everyone always goes to the thought of well, what I would want is what God would want. Why not? Other thoughts. I I found this one the most challenging one yet, just because. Like you were saying, we've just always kind of focused on the free gift. Never thought about it. And I love, one of my favorite things is to take uh, Western culture and look at the difference of Eastern cultures. And I love authors that try to unpack some of that. And it always is eye-opening, but I've never heard it in terms of this. Like, um, it, it's a Western mindset that a gift is for me. That's news to me. I didn't realize that. 
I don't know what God would do with it. My, the idea of what is a gift. In my early days, a gift to the children was to get a response. Now, a gift is a gift. Hmm. There's something I'm giving you. It's yours. It's your responsibility to do as, it, as you please. Uh, and that goes for everything. Once I give us give something away, I don't expect it. I expect them to enjoy it, however it's in their yeah. mindset. Uh, so I don't know how that corresponds to what God would say is, because that's a little bit different than, than uh, but a gift is something you give. And if you have a strings attached to it, it's not a gift anymore. Right. That's the way I heard it. Yeah. Although I'm at the age now where my kids are old enough to start giving gifts and not just getting. And so it's like this, how do you teach them to, okay, you can actually like put thought into this and give something also. Not to me, but to other people. It's like teaching them to give gifts. Um, I'm curious, and I know uh, one of my favorite authors, I passed many of these books on to Dave, is Robert Ferrer K. Pond, who is all about, uh, one of the reasons I love his books is he's all about taking almost all the parables of Jesus, flipping them on their ear and making you go, oh, it's all about grace. Everything Jesus teaches about grace. So he, I'm curious, what do you think he would say about it? this because i think he would be all over it yeah um because the, the, um, well i'm at a loss to figure out which particular of his parables would show that he doesn't spend a lot of time with Paul in his writing so yeah it's it's all parables parables of jesus but uh, i would think probably prodigal son Terms of um, the same sort of family dynamic where the, the son rejects the family and takes off. Yeah. Tells the father he's dead. And then when he comes back, the father's like, You're back in the family now. Mm. How exciting is that? Everybody should be celebrating because you're back. But then the one who kicks himself out of the family is the older brother who says, I can't deal with the grace. Yeah. Yeah, for Robert for our Pond, he's always, if every one of Jesus' parables, he turns into grace, but it, he, he still says we can turn away from the grace, but God's going to keep coming after us. Even beyond death, God's going to keep coming after us. We can be like, uh, who's the uh, rich man and Lazarus? We can be at the at beyond in Hades, still wanting, uh, still wanting to be served, and still turning away from God, but God's going to keep coming after us. Uh, all right, I'm over time, but I think good discussion. Um, I just had one more question. Please, yeah. Excuse me for saying this, okay? And it's facetious, okay. What is grace anyway? It's by faith you are saved. Mm -hmm. So it's by faith. And where does grace come into it? What do you think? A question. Yeah. Other thoughts? I'm sorry. I no, it's a great. I think in my initial response would be that they go hand in hand. That somehow we can give it the grace to have faith. I think that's kind of what he says is that um, it's not me, it's God. It's like this bizarre back and forth of I do this, but it's really God. And I, I kind of put my hand in hand. Um, I didn't mean it to be. Negative one. No, I know. Yeah. 
through my mind that was quite crazy or something. So I'm not yeah. trying to reconcile it. And it can take take that all sorts of directions. See, the people that don't have faith, do they get great? I hope so. <laughs> I think so. Certainly not something, and like I think he said in the video, certainly not something we can uh, all figure out tonight, but I think it's good to wrestle with it. And hopefully you're finding him challenging, and I know it can be a little uh, academic, but I think it's been interesting for me so, so far. Other thoughts before I praise that? Good and gracious God, thanks again for this night for um, heavy, challenging, and hopefully uh, evolving words that help us to think about our faith and maybe renew it in some ways, maybe challenge us in some ways. We always want to grow. We never want to be people that say we got it figured out and we're done. And so you know, that's true for me, and I hope for everyone in this room. Um, we are humbled sometimes by what we don't know, and uh, hopefully we're enlightened by what we do know. And so continue to work on us with this word called grace. Continue to help us to be people who want to respond to it, um, whether it's reciprocity or response, whatever it is. Make us people who follow after you and give our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Thanks online. Good night. What was that author's name? Robert. John M. G. Barkley. No. Oh, Robert Farrar Capon. Yeah. Um, Capon. C A P O N. That's his last name. Yeah. Um, parables of Grace, Parables of Judgment, and Parables of Kingdom. And you can get it all in one book now. It used to be three books. You get all in one. Grace, kingdom, and what? Judgment. Judgment. Uh, yeah, on Amazon now, I think it's all one book. He's deceased. He's uh, Episcopalian priest. Oh, okay. Um, but really good stuff. And it's it's not a thick book, but it's it's not hard reading, but it's something that you have to read a couple of times. It's, not that it's scholarly, it's just he says so much. Yeah.